Today's guest, Bernie Pascal, legendary sportscaster who's covered some of the greatest events in Canadian history. Joe Tilly's great Canadian sports show, coming up! Today's guest was born in Flin Flon, Manitoba. He called games for CFAR for the Flin, the Flin Flon Bombers games. He was sports anchor at BC TV for 30 years. He called the Canucks, Whitecaps, BC Lions games. He covered six Olympics for CTV. He called the Miracle on Ice game. He called the Perfect 10 performance by Nadia Kamarichi. He was Western Canada's top sportscaster on numerous occasions. He's a member of the Canadian Broadcasting Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Bernie Pascal. Bernie, great to have you here, my friend. Yeah, hi, Joe. And just one quick uh, correction there. I wasn't born in Flin Flon, Manitoba. I was born in Toronto, Ontario at St. Michael's Hospital. Grew up in Scarborough, Ontario. My first radio job was in Flin Flon, and it was to be a summer job uh, when I was going to high school and uh, college in Toronto. We would do a weekend show on CFRB, and they said, we'll help you get a summer job. And they sent audio tapes out around the country for us. And I had relatives in Winnipeg, so thought, hey, Flin Flon would be a great place to uh, visit because I'd be close to my relatives in the summer. Little did I know it was 14 hours apart from Flin Flon to Winnipeg. So uh, I went up there and uh, broadcast hockey and got involved and it was nonstop after that. But uh, Flin Flon was my first broadcasting start, but I was born in Toronto. Well, I apologize for that, Bernie. I got my information incorrectly here. So, uh, yeah. So, a Toronto boy. Well, there you go. That makes it makes all the sense in the world. So, uh, the uh, who was it at CFRB at the time that was uh, running the program for you guys, allowing you to, to, uh, to, you know, get these jobs all across the country and get those tapes out for you? Well, it was interesting. Wally Crowder, uh, who didn't have a significant part of our uh, youth, was called Youth in Action on CFRB, but he would drop in occasionally, and uh, he was an icon in Toronto, the great morning broadcaster, and he would come in and talk to us briefly, but there were high school kids from all over different schools in Toronto that had an interest in broadcasting, and one week uh, you'd be interviewing a politician on a panel the next week, you'd be doing a hockey player. The next week, you'd be uh, serving the uh, soft drinks at the door. You'd be taking tickets. So it was a wide-consuming uh, introduction to uh, broadcasting. And uh, one of my first guests I ever interviewed was Howie Meeker, who was with the Toronto Maple Leafs <laughs> at the time. And uh, it was amazing because we were neighbors here on the island until he passed away a couple of years ago. And... Uh, he was my color commentator for a couple of years on Vancouver Canuck hockey. So it's amazing how that uh, transpired over the years that I was like 16 or 17 years of age interviewing him as he was with the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. He was coaching at the time and uh, that our career paths uh, followed each other down the road. But it was a great introduction and uh, it was uh, called Youth in Action on CFRB. And uh, I'm not sure. Um, of many of the kids that moved on to other broadcasting, but I know uh, some went to Barrie, some went to Aurelia, some uh, went to Saskatoon. So it was all over the country that uh, they helped you get a summer job. Well, golly gee willikers, Howie Baker, <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> so, uh, so did you know right from the beginning that this was the career for you, Bernie? I mean, did you say that this is, I've got to be a, a broadcaster, that's it. It's amazing, Joe, how it uh, transpires, isn't it? Because I remember playing uh, basketball, playing hockey as a kid in Toronto, and you're all always emulate. In fact, uh, I was talking to a, an old friend recently, and he said, "Bernie, I remember when you were brought, when you were uh, playing hockey, uh, you'd come to the bench and pretend you're Foster Hewitt and Bill Hewitt and Danny Gallivan, and it was just a, a fun approach, and it was something that I took serious after that, and uh, it turned into a pretty good career and I was very excited to uh, make the stops that I did but on a career path that it's amazing growing up in Toronto 
and uh, working at CFTO. And you're an alumnus of uh, CFTO, and uh, you've had uh, um, past alumni on, including Brian McFarland. But I remember I was working in Winnipeg at the time, and Johnny Esau, who was our CTV uh, president of sports, uh, said, Bernie, we're looking for someone in uh, in Toronto at CFTO. Would you be interested? And I said, sure, John. He said, and in those days, this is one selling point, Johnny, and you would appreciate this, Joe, because Johnny said, Bernie, if you come to CFTO, you have a chance to do hockey and football. And you know what? You get a pass and you can sit and watch a game in Maple Leaf Gardens. Well, that was one of the selling points. Imagine telling oh, me today, you, you, get a, you get a credential to go to the Air Canada Centre or to Rogers Place or whatever. But that was one of Johnny's great selling points. And he lived up to his word. And uh, it, it was uh, one of the highlights to come back to Toronto, where I grew up and had a lot of friends and family. And then one day, uh, Johnny came to me. And I'd been at CFTO probably about two years then. And he said, Bernie, you're the third person on the totem pole here. There's, of course, Johnny, and there was Pat Marsden, and I was the third. So, Joe, as you can appreciate, when they're away doing their international or football, you're holding down the fort and doing all the shows. <laughs> right. But right. Johnny came to me and he said, Bernie, they're looking for a sports director in Vancouver at BCTV, and uh, they're seriously interested in hiring you. And I said, John, well, you know, this is the ultimate, working at CFTO, being in Toronto. And he said, well, if, if you accept the position as sports director in Vancouver, I'll put you on the CFL football crew immediately. You'll do Memorial Cups because we have the rights for the next five years. And international hockey will be on your plate as well, because each year we negotiate and you'll be involved in world championships and Olympics. And that was too enticing to pass up. So in talking to Vancouver and uh, the situation there and then getting the clearance to do some of the CTV assignments, it was uh, a no-brainer. And that's uh, how I moved out of CFTO and uh, went to uh, Vancouver. And then they were looking for a replacement. And I remember Johnny saying, Bernie, is there anyone that you know in, in, in Toronto that would be interested in filling your spot? Well. There were a few radio broadcasters, and we threw out a few names. And Fergie Oliver had just moved from Moose Jaw <laughs> to Montreal. I don't think he'd been there. Th I don't think he'd been there three months. And he calls and says, "Bernie, it's Fergie. I'm looking to come to Toronto." I said, "Fergie, you just got hired in Montreal." He said, "But I want to come to Toronto." So I don't think Dick Urban was the happiest camper after moving him from Moose Jaw. <laughs> into Montreal, and then Fergie came to CFTO. But it's amazing how the world turns in this uh, fascinating business. <laughs> That's crazy. And you know what? When Fergie left, you know, some 20 years later, when he left CFTO, there was an opening. And I had yeah. just sent uh, Pat Mars in a tape uh, like two days before Fergie walked into his office and quit. And I was just looking for like a, some direction, some like uh, him to critique my work, more or less. I wasn't actually applying for a job per se. And then, you know, he looked at my tape, liked the tape, and Fergie walked into his office a day or two later. And, uh, you know, it's funny how things work out, but there you go. So that's that's our connection through through Fergie. Well, and, and to Pat, Pat too. And Pat, Pat was a special person, and uh, we uh, admired him and worked with him for many years. And you could have a three-hour show here uh, on Patrick Marsden, that's for sure. <laughs> you know what? That's an idea. We'll do that one of these days. So uh, you get you get the job at BCTV, and Johnny was true to his word. He gave you lots of opportunities for some international work. And But uh, I, we were talking here, and you sent me some information. And one of the stories uh, you covered early early on in your days at BCTV was when Muhammad Ali was in Vancouver for his big fight with George Chevalo. And, uh, you know, this is uh, from a piece that Global TV did recently. Uh, you were there when Ali was chopping wood to get in shape for that boat. Uh, tell us about this experience with Ali, the great one, the well, greatest. Joe, it was, on a, it was on a Sunday morning, and that was in 1972, and he was preparing to fight uh, George Chevallo. 
And he had been training in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, as you recall, and his big training method was chopping trees. So I had an idea and I went to uh, Irv Ungerman and I went to uh, Angelo Dundee and the promoter, Murray Pezim, and I said, can we arrange to have Muhammad Ali and we'll pick him up on a Sunday morning? So you can imagine this in downtown Vancouver, the camera person and myself, we go to the hotel where Muhammad Ali is, pick him up on a Sunday morning. He hops with Angelo Dundee in our van. We leave downtown Vancouver. We go over the Lionsgate Bridge into North Vancouver. And we are looking for a forest area, which isn't hard to find. And we right. stopped at this one. We stopped at this one spot, and Muhammad Ali, and we brought an axe along with us. And we hop out, and Muhammad Ali says, "For goodness' sakes, don't tell anyone where we are, because I don't want to be sued. <laughs> we're probably going on private property, and we're chopping down trees." But, you know, he, he had that magnetic personality. And we don't see it in, in that uh, segment there, but he's chopping the tree. And then finally he gets one tree and it starts to fall, but it doesn't come all the way down. Oh. It's on another tree. And Muhammad Ali, without missing a beat, looks directly into the camera lens and says, you Canadians are stubborn. George Chabello will <laughs> not fall. <laughs> I mean, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't have programmed it any better. You, you would have. You would have been there Hollywood days for for many moons trying to, to, to set that up. But it was just instantaneous on cue, and uh, that helped sell tickets, I'm sure. But, Joe, can you imagine it would never happen today where you could get someone as significant as Muhammad Ali to hop in a van, drive across Vancouver downtown, over the bridge, into North Vancouver, and we were the only media to have them. And remember, that's before TSN, that's before Sportsnet. Uh, so it was a competitive aspect. We had to do something to uh, get something over the CBC locally. And it was on the CTV National News. It was on, remember the show Sports Beat, uh, produced by Ed Marcel yes. and hosted by Pat Marsden. They used that segment. And uh, it was a, a real showcase. And it was a, a, fun, a fun time. And it was good to see that video again. So, okay, the Northwest Eagles Boxing Club hosted Ali's training sessions. Elio IS ran the club. Now, here's a clip from his son, David, who remembers Ali being there. What I remember is uh, coming down with my mom on the first day that Ali was working out. I could feel the electricity. There was something incredibly special going on. People wandered in off the street to come and watch. So here's yeah, another a crazy memorable, coincidence. Go ahead. Very Chris memorable time. And, uh, and, and there again, you have Muhammad Ali going to a, a small gym and uh, promoting boxing, promoting the fight. And uh, Ilio Ayas, uh, I had the opportunity, he was a, a, a referee and a boxing coach. And we had the opportunity, we did the, I think the Canadian boxing championships were held in Vancouver. And CTV would look to have someone do color. And Cameron Rourke was the uh, producer, and he said, Bernie, do you know Elio Ayas? I said, well, I've met him. And uh, he said, well, we're, we're hiring him to do your color unboxing. So uh, I didn't know a lot about the sport, and Elio Ayas uh, was the expert and uh, made us all look good. But it's amazing how paths cross, and that was a couple of years after the Muhammad Ali fight. Okay, how is this for a crazy coincidence for you? So I, I fought David Ayas. You know, you probably knew that I used to be a boxer one day. One yes. time. I fought David Ayas at the 1978 BC Gold Gloves at Pacific Coliseum. That's a crazy coincidence, isn't it? Oh, there you are. I wonder <laughs> if that was the event that we did and his dad was doing color. It possibly could have been the same. We have, have to possibly, dig up that video. Possibly. It's, it's probably there somewhere in the CTV yeah. archives. <laughs> right well there you go Wouldn't that be something so uh yeah that was uh crazy when i when i saw that video and i saw david eyes oh my god i fought david eyes that's so cool <laughs> yeah so anyway uh we want to move on to some hockey here you called some huge international games for ctv like the 1976 canada cup uh now this is four years after the summit series 
You did the play-by-play. -play. Canada and Czechoslovakia in the final. They needed overtime. Let's have a listen to Bernie Pascal. And Borjak's here to break it up. Eight minutes and 43 seconds remain. And the puck is sailing down the ice. Savard. And Peter Stashny back for it. Potvan takes it. Ahead to Lanny McDonald. To Marcel Dion to Sittler. Sittler gets by. Right in on goal. A shot. Bring back some great good memories, memories for you. Oh, that was great, Joe. That was uh, game two. It was a best of three final against uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, the first game was at Maple Leaf Gardens. And then this game at the Forum in Montreal. And it went into overtime. And a spectacular goal by Daryl Sittler. And the one item I always point out, all five players on Team Canada touched the puck. The two defensemen. Then it went to Dion, to Lanny McDonald, to Daryl Sittler. So all five uh, completed the passing play. And then uh, Daryl Sittler takes the step around Vladimir Zarilla, who didn't start the game. Holacek started the game because he finished in Toronto. And they took Holacek out and put Zarilla in. And it was Don Cherry that took credit. And he told the players in the dressing room, he comes away out. So when he comes out, if you get a chance, then sweep around him. And that's exactly what uh, Daryl Sittler does and scores the winning goal in 1976. And I remember Johnny Esau and Oliver Babarad sending us a note after, and he's, they both said, this game was the highest rated sports telecast in Canada at the time. They had over 10 million viewers uh, watching Holy. Uh, that exciting game. And, uh, you know, that, that's amazing that, uh, that those kind of numbers and uh, uh, over 10 million watching that thrilling overtime goal by Daryl Sittler. And Team Canada, uh, Joe, that might have been the best team ever assembled. 18 players from that Team Canada squad are inducted in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And others are probably wow. pretty close to being inducted as well. And you had Scotty Bowman coaching. You had assistant coaches. Uh, like uh, like uh, Don Cherry, and it was just uh, magic. And it, it uh, was one of the greatest events I ever covered, and it was uh, great to see that video again. It was one – well, Bobby Orr was, was kind of his swan song too, wasn't it? Didn't he have a fantastic yeah. uh, series? Isn't it ironic on that winning goal, Bobby's not on the ice, um, but Bobby Orr was selected the most valuable player in the 1976 Canada Cup. He was playing on his wonky knee, but he was still the best defenseman, the best player, as uh, I mentioned, uh, named the MVP. And boy, what a class act he was over the years. And I remember many years later, I'm emceeing a function with him in, in Vancouver, and I'm sitting next to him. And you know how he has his little uh, minor, uh, or his hockey cards with Bobby Orr, and he had kids and families lining up, <clears throat> and he was autographing his card. And I'm sitting next to him at this uh, dinner, and I said, Bobby, I, one thing I never received was a Bobby Orr signed card. Can you sign one of those and give it to me? He says, no, Bernie, I'm not giving it to you. I, Please, just sign. No, I'll send you something. I'll, I'll, I'll send you one in the mail. Well, Joe, about two weeks later, I get this magnificent picture of his winning goal against St. Louis, a personalized message signed by Bobby Orr. And the one thing I've kept, of course, the picture, but the uh, folder that it was uh, mailed in, because on the declaration form, the little green form they have to put on for declaration, itemizing what it is, it's a photo, and then it's signed by Bobby Orr. <laughs> so he took it to the wow. post office himself and has his name, on, and I think that that's almost as important as having the picture. But that was Bobby Orr, and he exuded class. And uh, when you see him today, he's still magnificent. Uh, and uh, he was the MVP in that Canada Cup. And what, what a great player, a great individual. 
Yeah, and I just looking at that line on the ice, hey, eh? Marcel Dion, Lanny McDonald, and Daryl Sittler. What a what a what a great line that was. And just one of yeah. several on that amazing team. Uh so you were also part of the uh the broadcast team for the nineteen eighty Winter Olympics. Uh you're in studio here with Lloyd Robertson as they're getting ready for USSR. Vic rolled up. Games for Team Canada. He's the key as far as Canada's performance today. And uh, I don't think they'll be blown out of the building at all. They'll skate with the Soviets. It should be an entertaining game. We're going now to Olympic Arena for Ron Roosh and Tom Watt and the commentary on Canada and the Soviet Union. Thanks very much, Lloyd. And let's take a look at your screen right now. There are a number of champions right there. On the right of your screen, Doug Risebrow. That's Doug Jarvis, Brian Angloom, and a fellow who played some pretty good goal for the Montreal Canadiens as well, Ken Dryden. And they are here to cheer Canada on. A tremendous amount of excitement there always is when Canada plays the Soviet Union. So you look at all those faces. Hey, isn't that cool? Yeah. Oh, that was amazing. That, that was one of the early games, and Ron and I alternated uh, on the broadcasting of the 1980 Olympics, and uh, he did that game against uh, uh, the Team Canada. I got assigned the, uh, the memorable game against the Soviets and the USA, and it was uh, just a glorified moment. It was uh, We had a, a, a close sh uh, shot there of... Uh, the, the team and uh, all the spectators. It was a small rink. And to do the 1980 uh, Miracle on Ice, ABC did it on a tape delay and showed it in prime time. CTV, we did the game live, meaning it was in the afternoon, or uh, late afternoon. So I remember during the game, Joe, I was getting notes passed on to me through the floor director coming from Oliver Babarad and Johnny Esau saying, Bernie, welcome WCCO Radio in Minneapolis. Welcome WGN Chicago, the radio stations. Because ABC, as I say, was doing it on a tape delay, so the non-ABC affiliate radio stations would be picking up our audio broadcast of our telecasts. So uh, throughout the course of the game, American cities were joining us in progress, and we were sitting as I say, right in the stands, Tom Watt was my color commentator. And Mark Johnson with Team USA scored two goals in that game. Um, and his mom was sitting right behind Tom Watt and I. And every time there'd be a big play, and especially when Mark scored, she would she knew Tom and gave Tom a big hug. <laughs> and then she gave me a hug. We're on the air. And it was just the, the celebration was very special. And it was a great memory, and uh, to have the electrifying crowd and, and that uh, one little segment there when they were showing Risebro and some of the players, there was Al Michaels in his uh, sweater. Yeah. And we at CTV had the Blazers on with the uh, CTV tie, and uh, just prior to that Russian-USA uh, game, uh, Al Michaels and I were just – in the washroom before getting our hair set and, and having yeah, yeah. in that old, in that building, the uh, above the urinal area, there was the big water tubs. And every once in a while it would spray. Well, wouldn't you know, just before <laughs> we're leaving there, it's spraying. So we got water. He's got water on his sweater. I got water on my, my blazer. We're using paper towels. That was the first time I'd ever met Al Michaels in my life. And we're, Patting each other with paper <laughs> towels, and he's going to his ABC spot with Ken Dryden, and I'm going out to the CTV location. So a little behind the scenes uh, memory there, but hey, uh, Joe, as you suggest, some great memories in broadcasting, and to get that opportunity to do Olympics and to do uh, the Canada Cups, and then it uh, triggered into doing Vancouver Canucks and so many Memorial Cups over the years. The Canadian Junior Championship, and it all hinged from working at CFTO and getting the opportunity where Johnny, in those days, there was no contracts. There was nothing in writing. It was a verbal agreement. If you go, we will assign you to these uh, international and, and world events, and they lived up to their word. You know, that's... Um... Just so hours before you heard the uh, Do You Believe in Miracles line from Al Michaels, 
Everybody in Canada had seen the game with Bernie Pastel's call, along with the folks in uh, Minneapolis radio and everywhere else that you, you mentioned. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And, uh, it, was, it was a special moment. And, you know, you have to admire uh, CTV uh, for going out and bidding and getting the rights for those Olympic Games. And I remember, you know, it wasn't an easy sell. And I remember uh, Esau telling me on occasion, you know, we're going to put a bid in for – say the world boxing or we're going to do a bid for the world figure skating championships but the only way we'll be able to get the rights we have to have the major tv stations agree to carry the telecasts he said automatically cfto will do it cfcf in montreal normally agrees but we need uh, bc tv in vancouver especially to come on board or we can't do it because it's not a national telecast. So anytime they were bidding, he would keep me in the loop. I would go to our president and vice president at BCTV and say, here's an opportunity. We can really make an impact. And it's a very significant event. It's important we carry it. And the problem, a lot of the times, if it was coming into our news hour, which was the mainstay of BCTV right. that had the Six seven hundred thousand dollars or six hundred and seven hundred thousand viewers that they didn't want to preempt that. So if the time would jockey and being on the west coast, it would most times because we'd get it at four or five in the afternoon, or maybe uh, on a tape delay a little later. But it was very vital to have BCTV as part of it. And those are things you don't realize that you just feel that hey, CTV is doing it; it's automatic but you had to get agreement because the stations were affiliated with CTV, but not owned by CTV. So you had to get the blessing of all these stations, CFCN in Calgary and CFRN in Edmonton also had to agree to join in the telecasts. Yep. Sun Wapta. My, that's where I grew up watching yeah. CF, CFRN. Uh, yeah. So it was very splintered back then. I, I, re, I re recall that, Bernie. It was like it was tough getting everybody on board. And I remember when Douglas Bassett was trying to get control of the network back in the in the 90s. And, and uh, there was a lot of pushback, particularly from BCTV, who ultimately ended up starting another station. Right. Well, exactly. Exactly. And it was just uh, in those days, it was competitive, but everyone had their own little protective area and they wanted. Uh, this to be the, the key in the province where they were and uh, uh, welcomed the CTV national news. That was a mainstay, but any, any specific sports programming, uh, it was a tough call on many events. And I know there were some events they would alert me and say, we're, we're doing this uh, event. And then at the last minute, they would say, we can't get unanimous decision. So we're not going to do it, uh, which was frustrating because, uh, and there were other times that, World Hockey Championships, I'd get a call. <coughs> Excuse me, Joe. I'd get a call on a Tuesday, and they'd say, uh, we're monitoring Canada's performance at the World Championships in Prague. And if Canada gets through the preliminary, we're going to decide to do the last three games. Can you go to Prague? So I'd be on standby and get a call maybe on the Friday morning we have you booked on a flight from, from Prague. You get there Saturday. We're doing the game Saturday night. So when you get there, it'll all be set up. And uh, what you'll have to do is get someone to do color. <laughs> I'd get <laughs> off the plane, hardly have time to check into the hotel. And this is before internet days. This is You couldn't do a lot of homework on the international players because there wasn't a lot of information, just what you read in the in the news media right. because internet was not happening. So you couldn't just Google um, right. Metal Mansky and find out what, what his history was. So you'd get off the plane, and the first person I would usually ask to do color would be the general manager of Team Canada. And John Ferguson was general manager a few times. I'd say, Fergie, you're coming up to the booth. Yes, okay. He'd come up, and he's more focused on the team doing well than having a headset on and trying to analyze yeah. a game. So he, he became a unique cheerleader. Um, I had Dave <laughs> King, I had George Kingston, the same, the, the same route. Um, 
uh, and that's how CTV operated. And the person at home had no idea. They didn't realize Bernie Pascal just got off the plane, had to get the uh, lineups, get a color commentator. And I had a friend that did Czech hockey over the years. Uh, Jan Slopiska was his name. And he spoke pretty good English. And I would alert him. I'd phone him and say, I'm coming in and I need some time with you to talk about the Czech lineup or to talk about Finland. And he'd always, before the game, we'd spend an hour. And, and that was a godsend because it certainly helped. But uh, we didn't have a cast of thousands like you see now. They do the whole championship and they go two weeks before for training camp. And so it's uh, a whole different game. But hey, it, it was a great experience. And I'm, I'm glad I had that opportunity. You mentioned the name Dave King, and, and you also talked about doing the Memorial Cup. We've got the uh, 1989 Memorial Cup final, Swift Current Broncos and Saskatoon Blades, and here you are working with another legend, Dave King. Vic, if we roll that. We're just... Oh, sorry, we're jumping around a little bit. Sorry, we, we, caught, we caught Vic off guard with that. So anyway... Um, <laughs> Sorry, Vic. Uh, we do have we do have you working here with Lou Nanny. This is 1982, December 28, 1982. Uh, Soviets versus the NHL Super Series. Uh, it's the opening game. You're previewing it here with Lou Nanny. Uh, Oilers versus Soviets. Let's roll that one. One can feel the emotion surrounding this game tonight between the Soviet Union and the Edmonton Oilers. And Lou Nanny, what about some key areas to look for in this game? Well, Bernie, you hit the nail on the head. Key areas are the thing tonight because there's a real revealing one. The Soviets have just announced Trechek has the flu. Mishkin, Vladimir Mishkin will be in the nets. As you well know, Trechek's been the goalie for the Russians since 1970 in all key encounters. Mishkin having uh, been used very sparingly once in the Canada Cup, where he, by the way, shut out the Canadians 6-0. But overall, Mishkin, nothing close to Trechek. This is a key area for Edmonton to exploit. Well, he was right. Uh, the Oilers would win that game 4-3, beating Michigan, but the Soviets took four out of six games. What, what do you recall about that series? Well, I remember it was, uh, as long as the Edmonton Oilers players were involved, it, it was a high profile, it was uh, high energy, and uh, working with Lou Nanny was very special. And uh, there again, it's amazing the opportunities you had. I, I worked with Dave King, I worked with Lou Nanny, I, I worked with Tom Watt, I worked with Ken Dryden. Um, uh, so many others, and it was uh, exciting times. And uh, uh, Lou is still a, a prominent figure in the Minnesota area, and it was a pleasure to work with him. Dick Irvin, we were talking one time, and and uh, I, had, I had forgotten about it. And uh, Dick said, "Oh, remember we did the Canada Cup together?" Then it rang a bell. I said, "Yes, in Quebec City." Could you imagine the thrill I had? I'm doing the play-by-play -play in Quebec City of a Canada Cup. Dick Urban is my color commentator. And uh, it was just like dying and going to heaven because when you think of Dick Urban, you think of Danny Gallivan and uh, Foster Hewitt, Bill Hewitt. Uh, so that was a real thrill. And a uh, quick story with Dick, 1976, we're in Innsbruck, Austria for the Olympic Games. And it was we had the morning off. And Dick said, Bernie, have you seen ski jumping? I said, Dick, I've never seen ski jumping live. He said, neither have I. So Dick and I got into the CTV van. They drove us to the, the uh, downhill and uh, the ski jumping area. And Dick had a little eight millimeter camera. And he was taking video of me and uh, the crowd. And so I held the camera and got pictures of Dick with, 100,000 people at this uh, Innsbruck ski jumping. And for years after, we talked about it and uh, just laughed all, you know, two media guys that hadn't really seen ski jumping before. And here we are like two little kids in a candy store. But that just shows the class of someone like Dick Irvin that uh, you can sit with him in a broadcast booth, you can do research with him, and you can go out on a ski jump and have a little fun in the snow. <laughs> Well, and ski jumping was kind of a big deal in Innsbruck back then, and all the European countries, right? Especially Finland. I know Finland's really huge in ski jumping. Yeah, yeah, that was in the Franz Clymer days, and 
and uh, high yeah. profile athletes. Yeah. So um, we have a sample of you on the desk. This is from 1996, uh, and there's some big news going on here for the BC Lions. Let's 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 have a look. A report on the Edmonton Oilers later tonight on News Hour Final Sports. Okay, that's the, that's the promo. Uh, but l- later on, the, it's called uh, Vic. It's called BCTV 1996. It's uh, it's uh, it, it's you talking about some changes with the BC Lions. Have we got that ready, Vic? Just give me a le- yes or no. We can if you can get that, we'll put it up. If not, we can come to a lip. Okay. Sorry, I'm jumping around. I've been jumping around here on you. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, uh, this is what the, you know, this is what we deal with the live television, right, Bernie? Sometimes stuff That's works, right, sometimes yeah. it doesn't. <laughs> so, uh, um, give me the, give me the, the, uh, verbal thumbs up, Vic. Mm-hmm. And if not, then, uh, we'll move on. Well, there's a prize video okay. there, Joel. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is good. Okay, so here we go. I, I mentioned earlier the 1989 Memorial Cup Final, Swift Current Broncos, Saskatoon Blades, and working with Dave King. Let's have a look. Uh, late in the period, and you talk about giving a team a lift. Saskatoon playing at home before more than 8,000 fans, and Koser is one of the real favorites with the Saskatoon Blades. He responds uh, with the fifth goal of the game, and that's the important one at this point. This goal was a good effort played by Koser, too, because he raced uh, 26 down the ice here, and he does an excellent job. He battles him right here. He's got a forward he battles with. He wins the puck. Uh, let's a good snapshot go, and it just squeaks through Kruger, and that was a good second effort played by Koser because he had out fight 26 for the puck and did a good job of getting it. Uh, what do you recall yeah, about that in, tournament in Koser? Yeah, I went into overtime, and they had great, great crowds in Saskatoon, and I know that championship game, the... The building was sold out, more than 11,000 people, and uh, the winning goal was scored by Tim Tisdale, and Joe Sackick's brother, Brian Sackick, was a member of the Swift Current Broncos, and uh, it, it was a great uh, great time and uh, 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 superb credit to the uh, Saskatoon area because they did a, a super job, and it was a stepping stone for a lot of those players moving on to pro hockey. Uh, after that great Memorial Cup. But you mentioned Dave King. Boy, what an icon in, in hockey and sports in Canada. And it was a pleasure. I did college games uh, with Dave King and to do the Memorial Cup with Dave. And I've done world championships. And he always came prepared and one of the most knowledgeable um, coaches and, and broadcasters that I've ever worked with. Yeah, that's what struck me about Dave. Smart guy, sharp guy, always prepared, and uh, uh, awesome, awesome guy. Um, so, okay, here we go. We're going to look at uh, Bernie on the desk in 1996. This is uh, so, some big news has just been announced from BC Lions. Have a look. Welcome now to Sports Center. The CFL is down to two teams, at least in terms of the playoffs, but basically the future of the CFL and franchises like our BC Lions remain big question marks. While the Lions season has been over for a few weeks, they'll kick off a marketing plan this week in an attempt to reach 15,000 season tickets for next season. Now, the new owner of the Lions, Hamilton businessman David Braley, arrived in the city late tonight. He was quick. So was yeah, there's, there's Braley good that, for the uh, Lions? Yeah, yeah. Did, Dave really did Lions? a good job. Yes, he, he saved, he helped save along with Bobby Ackles and, uh, and a very active group uh, in, in Vancouver. But uh, the one problem with Dave that he lived in Hamilton, he was really an Argo and a Hamilton Tiger Cat fan, but uh, he did with, deep into the pocketbook and, uh, and put some dollars into the Lions franchise because I think Without David Braley, it wouldn't have uh, survived. And uh, and now they have new local ownership, and they're rekindling the interest. There's more interest in the BC Lions today than there have been probably in the last dozen years, Joe. And uh, it's all because of local ownership, and they're promoting and doing a lot of great uh, enterprising events, and uh, it's great for the CFL. 
Yeah, there was a time there where Braley owned the Argos and the Lions at the same time. That's a little bit weird, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> and then when the Lions would go into Hamilton, uh, he'd always have the whole team over to his uh, uh, mansion and have a big barbecue. You can imagine the cleanup process after something like that. But uh, good on David Braley, and uh, uh, he was a key figure in, in helping survive football and keep it uh, steady here in, in British Columbia. And it was unfortunately passed away several years ago, but uh, he was an icon in the CFL. We have another uh, piece here. This is Paul Patsko dug it up. It appears to be an event where you're, you're sharing, sharing some stories. Uh, let, let's watch. Hockey team. They're competing in Salt Lake City. Their opponents in the gold medal game, the United States, had not lost in 35 games. Here we are, the gold medal game. Canada is handed eight consecutive penalties, so they have to dig down deep, and they have to kill off those penalties, and that they do, and they win a gold medal. The first time Canadian women have a gold medal in Olympic hockey history. And a sidebar to that story, our men's Olympic team sitting in the stands, witnessing this great inspirational effort on the ice. The men follow up with their own gold medal. So Canada wins their first ever gold medals in women's and men's hockey at the Salt Lake City Olympics. Okay, so first of all, where was this at? That was at a sporting event on the Lower Mainland. I can't remember specifically where it was, but uh, they invite this out, Joe, to speak at various functions, and it's always uh, fun to do that. And... Uh, to bring back great memories. And my daughter-in-law, Cassie Campbell Pascal, was the captain of Team Canada in Salt Lake City. And that was a proud moment. Uh, her family was there. Our family was there. And it was uh, a very special time. And then to watch uh, the men follow up and uh, win the gold medal, a double gold in Salt Lake City. And it uh, was a great uh, moment in sports history and hockey history for Team Canada win uh, men and women. Well, right. So you 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 touched on uh, on Cassie, and I was going to bring that into it. So, oh, here she is, two time Olympic gold medal winner, and uh, she's married to your son Brad, who was a hockey player, played NCAA uh, for North Dakota. There's a shot of him drafted by the Sabers, played in the AHL East Coast Hockey League. Now he's an assistant GM with the Flames. You know, married to Cassie. I'm, I'm thinking that uh, you might have some pretty talented grandkids there. Well, we have one granddaughter, and uh, Brooke is her name, Brooke Violet, and she plays hockey, and she plays almost every sport possible, and she's uh, just a, has an infectious personality and just the greatest granddaughter ever, and uh, she loves hockey and plays uh, on a regular basis. She plays badminton. She plays uh, volleyball, so she's very active, and uh, that was a picture at the uh, uh, the wedding of Brad and Cassie, and in the wedding party uh, was Dave Haxtall. And Dave was Brad's defense right. partner at the University of North Dakota, and uh, they've been lifelong friends. And Dave Haxtall, as you know, is now the head coach of the Seattle Kraken. So uh, there's a, a great friendship there, and, and uh, we see Dave uh, frequently. We've had the opportunity to have Dave stay at our home. And... Uh, it, it's the hockey world. It's amazing how it brings everyone together and sports world in general, Joe. It's it's just amazing. The connections and the friendships you develop over the years. Yeah, what a great story, Hexel and the uh, and the Kraken were getting as far as they did and but almost almost all the way uh, to the final four. Um, so the Flames make a their decision today on who the next general manager is going to be. I know it's not going to be Brad. From what I understand, it's going to be Craig Conway. Uh, what, uh, what do you know about the situation in Calgary? Well, the situation, I'm a great fan and uh, support Brad. Uh, it's amazing. He's uh, done remarkably well in his career. He was vice president of hockey uh, for the uh, Hockey Canada program. He's won so many gold medals. In fact, uh, when you put the gold medals Cassie's won and Brad has won with World Juniors, Olympics, uh, Spengler Cups, uh, it's a great display to see all this uh, uh, medallions up and showcased in their home. But 
Uh, we're very proud of Brad. He had a great hockey career. And uh, his brother, uh, Brian, played in the Western Hockey League and also was a great hockey player and went into the, the real business world and has done extremely well in the United States. And uh, so we're very proud of uh, Brad and Brian and, and the whole family. So Cassie is now involved with Hockey Canada. They made some changes there. And uh, what, uh, what do you think she'll bring to, the, to, the, uh, to that board? Well, she brings credibility, of course, and she brings expertise. And uh, uh, Cassie was one of the greatest women player of all time. And she started out as a defenseman and was an all-star defenseman. Then she moved up to the forward line and became a mainstay as one of Canada's elite forwards. And as I say, was captain of a couple of Olympic teams. And I think just her leadership, and she's involved in so many activities Ronald McDonald House and uh, the Scotia Hockey Fest uh, for girls, uh, so many programs. And her involvement with Hockey Canada will uh, be a real positive. And I know she takes a lot of pride in, um, in supporting hockey in Canada. And I think it'll be a significant uh, a result having Cassie and, and uh, that whole committee involved and taking a whole new approach and, and focusing on strengthening and improving hockey, women and men in Canada. Yeah, awesome. You know, you talk about her charity involvement, and, and you, my gosh, you've been involved in tons of charity work over the years. Here you are at the Greater Vancouver Food Bank Drive. We got that clip, Vic, roll it. Bernie, out to you at Savon's in Coquitlam. Yes, thank you, Brian. We're at Pine Tree Village in Coquitlam, and uh, hey, we have the food train coming from the employees at Save On Foods. Jeff is busy loading up the truck here. Good morning, Rod. I see you morning, uh, supporting us again. You betcha we are. We're uh, really glad to help out, and it's good to see everybody down here opening up and donating all this food to a good cause. That's okay, great. thanks for your cooperation, everyone out here at Save On Foods, uh, Pine Tree Village in Coquitlam, and uh, as Wayne mentioned, we're taking a bit of a break. We'll be back a little later. <laughs> Looked like a and very just, successful just, just event. A quick, quick follow-up on that story. Uh, Nick Hebler, the former BC Lion, uh, he was uh, part-time delivering, I think it was Nally's potato chips, and he pulled up his van, uh -huh. and he saw us there, and, and Nick came over, and he reached us into his pocket, and he pulls out a $100 bill, and he said, Bernie, this is for the kids. And uh, without asking, without uh, seeking any contribution, uh, that just shows uh, someone like Nick Hebler out of his own pocket donating a hundred bucks to that uh, fund. I'll, I'll never forget that day, and I, I see Nick frequently at Lions games and functions, and it just speaks volumes for what former players do and helping various charities. And uh, as far as charities, I've been involved with Special Olympics since 1968, and it all started uh, Joe at CFTO. And Special Olympics, uh, there was an advertising person that did a lot of his company, uh, did a lot of representation for CFTO and the major outlets in Toronto. Red Foster phoned me one day and he said, Bernie, we're starting a Special Olympics and the first ever games will be in Chicago. This was the summer of 1968. And he said, we have the full cooperation of Harold Ballard. Can you imagine that? Ballard was uh, a frosty and uh, a cold individual from the outside, but uh, Red Foster says, we're going to fly George Armstrong and we're flying Harold Ballard and we're taking a bunch of kids and we're going to play a floor hockey game against Chicago. And we'd like you to come if you could get a camera person. So I went to Johnny Esau and said, this is the deal. What's it going to cost? I said, nothing. <laughs> so there we are on Harold Ballard's plane. We go to Chicago and uh, we have the floor hockey tournament. And uh, Maria Shriver is uh, representing Special Olympics. We're at Soldier Field. It's not capacity, but probably 20,000 people. We do a feature on the floor hockey. And from that day, I've been involved with Special Olympics on a regular basis. And just to I have this here. They gave me a 50-year medal recently, uh, involvement with Special Olympics from 1968. So 
it's something dear to my heart, and it all stemmed from that one trip going to Chicago to cover the first ever, and here it is more than 50 years later, and it's, it's a great event. But Joe, as you mentioned, you're actively involved with charities. We all are. There's so many good ones, and uh, you can't do them all, but we certainly uh, try to put, play a small part in helping where we can. Yeah, you're and you're right about Harold Ballard. He was he was a crusty old fart, no doubt about it. And, and he did a lot of bad, a lot of bad things for the hockey club. But he did have a soft spot for the kids. He helped out with Special Olympics. He always made you know the the uh, Maple Leaf Gardens available for Easter Seal skate for Timmy and everything else. And he, you know there was there was that side of it that uh, a lot of us forget about, no doubt about that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. We, yeah, we we actually have you from the. Uh, the uh, Special Olympics Hall of Fame induction you were hosting recently, and uh, l let's have a look at that. Third year, maybe this year. <laughs> <laughs> Others may know me as a longtime champion of Special Olympic athletes. I'm proud to say that I covered the first ever Special Olympic Games in Chicago in 1968. Wow. That makes me. makes me almost as old as Michael Campbell. <laughs> I've been a proud supporter of this life-changing movement ever since. So that you 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 touched touched with that and you told us about that event, but uh, you know I just wanted to throw that in there just because we have it, you know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah, no, that was uh, great memories, and uh, we, we were sworn to secrecy. We at the time we were told we couldn't say anything about. Uh, being on Harold Ballard's plane, that he was contributing uh, goodwill. And uh, so we just said we flew to Chicago, and it was in later years that we came out and, and, and gave him credit. But he didn't want credit. He didn't want anyone to know that uh, he was uh, providing transportation for us to go to Chicago and, and to help Special Olympics to keep the persona, I guess, so people uh, wouldn't think that he was a softie. Oh, right, right. He wanted to keep that crusty exterior, and he wanted people to believe that's who he was. I don't care about that stuff. I don't care. Isn't that, that true? Yeah. Hey, hey and, and Joe, in, in those days, I remember we'd go down to do interviews, and we'd have to make sure at CFTO we had a cameraman that had a battery pack because Harold Ballard would not allow TV cameramen to plug in their lights. If you're plugging in your lights, I want to get a check. So CBC, <laughs> CFTO, you can't use my power. So we always say, hey, if we're doing interviews at the gardens, make sure the cameraman has a battery pack because we can't plug it in. <laughs> Can you believe right. that? And that, that's a true story because yeah. occasionally you'd show up and the cameraman would come, where can I plug in? Because he had to get, he didn't have a battery pack or whatever. And he had, and no, nope, there's no way you could, so we couldn't do any interviews. <laughs> and, and probably shooting film in those days. So that was really oh, complicated. Yeah. Well, well, in those days, a lot yeah. of times you'd shoot for the late sports. You could only shoot the first period. And the score right. would be 0-0 zero, zero after the first. And that was your highlight package for the late sports because yeah. it had to be shipped out to agent court. It had to be processed, then edited. So you'd go on and do your late night sports cast and you'd be showing Johnny Bauer making this save or Dave Keon getting a good scoring chance. The final score is like six, two, but you don't have any goals because you had to just shoot the first period. Tomorrow you'd have the goals, yeah, but yeah. it's amazing what yeah. we did in those days. And it was uh, just, just yeah. part of the hockey development. <laughs> Yes, that's right. I, I had the same problem even later on. So there you go. It's uh, scoreless after the first, but you know Frank Mahalba <laughs> scored four times in the second, at least one sixty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will have highlights yeah. tomorrow. Not yeah, we'll have highlights tomorrow. tomorrow. We got highlights. Yeah, and we'll have Jay's highlights tomorrow, and we'll have all kinds of stuff. Yeah. That's, that's... So, uh, Bernie, I got to ask you what? What's this? Is my son always asks gets me to ask this question? What's the best advice you have ever received? Well, the best advice, I think, was just be yourself, um, be sincere, be good to people, and work at it. And I think uh, those are some areas that uh, have followed me in my career, that uh, you have to be a dedicated individual and have to enjoy your position, your job, 
And I think if you can combine those ingredients, uh, you'll have a pretty good career and, and you'll enjoy it. It's been uh, wonderful. I've had uh, some great memories. And I think just with a strong work ethic and, uh, you know, don't step on too many toes. Uh, just uh, be yourself and be energetic and dedicated. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, Pat Marsden said that to me too. He said, be yourself. And he said, uh, he added, uh, it doesn't matter if they like you, Joe, just as long as they're watching. It's a lot true, yeah. And Patrick, yeah, that Patrick was pretty good at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He led the parade in that he, area. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, he, I remember, he, 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 I remember one ahead, time yeah. we were in the, I forget what the per diem was, but we got like 10 cents a mile or something if if we went to Hamilton to cover a event or a football yeah. game or a leaf training camp. And this one Sunday, Marsden was doing the uh, telecast out of Hamilton and I was helping on the telecast doing stats or whatever. And uh, so we drive over together on the Sunday morning and we come back, uh, you know, after the game, but we put our expense account, expense account in the next day and Pat and I are in the office figuring out, well, it's, uh, what is it? 42 miles each way to ham, whatever. And so yeah. we put down times 10, and we submit that, and we stopped and had a coffee, and we put that in. And Esau, who watched every nickel and dime, no question about yeah. it, he he calls. I was in the office the next morning. Pat hadn't come in yet. And Johnny says, I see uh, you and Pat went there for the game, and you submitted your expenses. It's not 42 or 44. It's only 38 kilometers. So you can't be charging yeah. us the extra four and five. So – there was a you know eighty cents knocked off our expense account. So, <laughs> uh, boy, that, and, and, and another point of and John Wells and I were talking about this recently when he worked at CTV doing football in the early days. Uh, the hosts on football, John Wells, Al McCann, Ken Newens, and myself, we shared a CTV jack. And Cam Roach was the producer. Cam would bring the jacket. If I was doing the game, say BC was playing in Regina, he'd bring the jacket into Regina. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd put the jacket on, wear it on the telecast. Then he would take the jacket after and go to Edmonton to do a game, and Al McCann would put the jacket yeah. on. And it was comical because we'd get to the point we'd put little notes inside the pocket if I knew Al was on. <laughs> And Al, da 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 da, and, and or John Wells. It wasn't until, and I think you'll recall, in Calgary, Al McCann had our prize jacket. It was a team jacket. Four of us wore it. And the horse on a touchdown bumped into Al and knocked him down. He was fine, <laughs> no, no injuries, but it ripped the jacket. And he had to take it off on the on the telecast. And from that day on, we all received our own personalized yeah. CTV jacket from Oliver Babbitt. <laughs> so, all right, the yeah. Can, the hell with the expense. We're going to get each of you guys your own jacket. That's big time, <laughs> man. Giving everybody their own yeah. jacket. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank uh, God for Oliver because if it was up to Johnny, he still would have shoe. It still would have been wearing the same uh, ripped up jacket. <laughs> Uh, Listen, yeah, uh, Bernie. Yeah. This has been this has been awesome catching up. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It, it, it's it's terrific. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe. And you're to be commended, and your crew. Uh, you know, I saw Mark Curtin on the other night. I, I Gary Monahan, who's a good friend, uh, Paul Beeston, and uh, it brings back so many great sports memories. And you're to be commended for this initiative, and it's been fun to be part of it, Joe. And all the best to you and your family, and. Uh, Hey, it's, it's great to talk sports, especially Canadian sports. Thanks, buddy. And yeah, say hi to Cassie. We met a few times. It's great. Thank you. I will. Okay, Joe. Thanks. Okay, more sports when we come back. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. And we have a winner for those four passes for the Hockey Hall of Fame. Dave May wrote us this. He said, I really enjoy your show. Just watch the three former Leafs. I am from Alberta and will be going to Toronto in July on a guy's trip. 
Sure would love to have those HOF passes, please. Well, how can you say no to that? Dave from Alberta, you have four tickets to the Hockey Hall of Fame en route to Alberta. My Cosa Swiss pick of the week. Last week, I took the number six horse Tuscan Prince in the $144,000 SBOA final for three-year-old cod trotting colts and geldings. He had the race in the bag as he turned for home, but broke stride. That allowed Osceola to charge into the lead. Duck McNair driving for trainer Greg McNair. Hasty bid got up for second. Now, I did tell you to box that trifecta. Three, five, nine returned $219.20. This week, I'm looking at the opening race of Thursday night's card, Philly and Mare Trot, the number eight horse, Dealer's Delight with Jody Jamison in the buggy coming off an impressive win last week. So let's go with the five, six, eight exacta and trifecta and five win plays on the number eight horse. For all the racing updates, visit T uh, Cosa TV on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Go to hpibet.com for your wagering options. Joe Tilly Sports is brought to you by Cosa. Central Ontario Standard Bread Association, providing a united voice for harness horse people racing at Ontario tracks. Check out your benefits today at COSAonline.com and check out COSA TV on Facebook and YouTube for all the latest harness news and live action updates. Live racing year round. Go to HPIBet.com for all your wagering options. Become a member today and your first bet is free. That's HPIBet.com. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com. We want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great people. We highly recommend them all, and thank you for your support of Canadian and local sports. A reminder that the show is available on Spotify, iTunes, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network, Zingo TV, and Buzz TV Live. Also, check out the show on YouTube. All of our past great shows and clips are on there. Like and subscribe. You know what? It's free. Thanks once again to Bernie Pascal for being on the show. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and overdeliver? Aldo has a tremendous team of experts on staff. They are committed to making your next real estate transaction smooth and comfortable. Call 416-GET-ALDO or visit getaldo.com. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family and your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686-5678. MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost-effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more, 
Their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more.